it, it's so by its nature divisive. Uh, now, now, Steve, to get you back in, into the discussion, yeah. from your perspective with the law enforcement background and, and your analytical mind, how you you scrutinize things. Uh, how do you see, with the benefit of hindsight, how the security apparatus kicked into gear? Like, do, were you aware of uh, of Halt gaining possession of that uh, audio tape of Larry's regression, or is this new to you also? No, that's all new to me. And matter of fact, I never even knew about any of that stuff until Larry came in and talked to me in the dorm that day. And then after he talked to me and after I got back into civilian life, I had nothing to do. I, I figured I was home free. I'm done. I'm out of there. Um, um, and But much like Larry, I got a call one day in the day room and it was uh, it was my old partner. And he said, uh, hey, I'm, I'm downstairs. Can you come down? I want to talk with you. And this was uh, Senior Airman Palmer. And uh, he's the one that witnessed the UFO with me. And uh, I was like, okay. And I went down and I see this dark car. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, here we go. So I was kind of jacked up getting ready to get in a fight the minute I I, I kind of looked in the back seat, kind of see what was going on, you know. So uh, so I sat in the front seat in the passenger seat. And uh, he asked me, hey, you know, how's it going? I heard you got in a bit of trouble and you're going to be getting you know, out of the Air Force and stuff like that. I just want to check, see how you're doing. As soon as he said that, I knew something was wrong because he was kind of self-centered and never seemed to really care about anybody but himself. Now, that was just my perspective. He might be a nice guy and that might be a mischaracter, mischaracterization, but at the time, that's, that was my perspective of him. And uh, I told him, hey, I said, listen, I'm out of here. I'm going to be getting out of the service soon. I just want to go home, forget I was ever in the service, forget everything that happened, and just start life over and just get on with it. Because I knew he was probing me. I could tell the way he was asking questions. And then afterwards, he, he confessed and he goes, hey, he goes, uh, by the way, he goes, uh, I'm Air Force OSI now. I said, what? And he said, yeah. He goes, I got promoted. I'm, uh, I'm OSI now. I'm like, oh, all right, cool. Good for you. So I think his first assignment was to go see if he could pump me for information, see where my head was at, you know, and see whether I was going to talk, not talk, or just get a feel for where I was at or something. Because, and that was the last time I talked with him. And we never even talked about the incident. We never talked about what we saw again ever after that. So, yeah. So I think he, he, he either was involved in my incident somehow, or he, was talked to afterwards and played nice, nice, and they gave him a promotion and, you know, whatever. Well, when you had that missing time experience, he was the guy that was standing alongside you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. You know, I've looked at this. What, what did I actually see? Everybody's asked me that. What do you think you saw? Did I see a craft? Yeah, I saw something. My mind says I saw this craft. But did I actually see it? Was I hallucinating? Did they hit me with something and give me a, a mind suggestion or something? Was it a hologram? Was it a slip in time where only we could see it and nobody else could? I have no idea, and I'll probably go to my grave never knowing, you know? I mean, it could be time travelers like uh, Tennyson thinks. I've uh, no idea. <laughs> so. well, well, there had been a pattern, uh, but in and and Burroughs talk about the light coming down and, and Bistenza talking about them being uh, paralyzed. And then next thing you know, they're going back to the staging area and they've been gone for 30 or 40 minutes. So something yeah. definitely happened to them. Uh, Larry, yeah. I, I wanted you to clarify some points also that you recall from when you were taken underground. You were at some point, I don't know if it was just you or you and, and perhaps uh, others, but you, you were placed on seats in kind of a small theater uh, resembling place and there was a, a big screen in front of you and then apparently some intelligence behind the screen you, you saw a silhouette or something uh, was speaking to you guys telepathically uh, could you, you bring us how you were led to that point and then, uh, then what happened I have a memory of that as I wrote it exactly still and it was it was it was like the old Sony big screen TVs, you know. That's all that my cousin had one in Boston for Sony, um, but it wasn't. Now this could all been put in. 
I wrote about it because I said, you know, there were other people also. That's all I can say because it's just pictures, just quick, uh, just quick. And then walking out of the photo lab on the Bentwaters runway. Uh, and looking back and going, what the hell? And uh, just as I wrote it in the book, and I've taken a polygraph, so I've passed that. I wasn't asked about that. In fact, I have to say, I don't bring up that aspect much now because it's just too, and I think it was designed to be just too far out, you know, looking back. But like I said, in the audio, the hypnosis that was done by Bud Hopkins and the theater was there when that was conducted. I was skeptical about hypnosis, very skeptical. And uh, there were other names in that. And it was very clinical. It was not an alien situation. It was, a, and there were, air, it was very clinical. So that's where that dynamic changes to go to your point on the spooks doing all, yeah. you know, and, and, and of that or whatever it is, you're already going to turn to dust what happened in that field. And what happened in that field is as clear as it can be for all the, it would be for all these years later. I mean, I always hear about Adrian and, you know, and, you know, he said a bunch of different things and how affected he was, very Christian guy. And, no, but listen, it wasn't easy for me either, you know. I was, oh, poor. And, you know, he's a wonderful guy. I remember, you know, him and me in March, like I wrote, you know, we got to go to the newspapers and all that. I think at that point, probably that day, that's when I went in Steve's room that afternoon and told him about what had happened because – Mastinja was freaked out. Guys, that you didn't even see other people anymore. There was no rumor mill. It wasn't a story from the pub. You know, that we have the guy Neville's, who was our disaster preparedness. The ah, I was there. His story has changed more than a Da Vinci painting, for whatever reason. I, I don't. Bridges on all of us, and he's a halt boy. He's a Colonel Holt narrative guy. The story you talk about uh, Burroughs and Bastinza going into the light, that was after I left the site. And John went forward. He wasn't allowed out there. He was back, you know, 50 yards or 100 yards, whatever it was, 100 yards. So uh, that was all the same night. And that is the night. You know, Steve Longjero was out there. I saw him go one way, and he's confirmed all this, you know. Uh, uh, a number of guys, and we were pretty new. I don't know. I had gone from C to D flight. They were flip, flipping me around. I had my PRP. I had all the stuff they say I didn't have. I got on that base the same day as Ed Cabanasak who was involved in night one, well, how come he was out there? But, you know, they just have this line, Hulk says horrible things. I, I, I had some real ugly troll types over here in England. You know who I mean. You know, they got themselves a bit famous, didn't they? With ab outright outlandish lies and stunning things. Peter jumped right on in with them. That was his out. And it was not a nice few years, which was the intention but here we are. Gary's book has come out. I uh, don't agree with all of it. However, as favorable as it is, it's still not exact on me. And it was not four nights. Now he's entitled to his opinion and he's done a good job. It caused problems with the whole, you know what I mean, the other thing. And, there's always politics in this stuff. To me, I just want movies out. The false narrative that has been in play since 1992. 
And that is led by Charles Holt. He knows it. I know it. He should take a polygraph. He never will. Steve doesn't have to because I know what happened to him. I knew him then. I know the score. But there's some other people, boy, that I, take one, Jim. Take one, John. Not John so much. John's, I think, very confused with it. He's, he's a pretty nice guy. But, you know, why aren't they held to the grindstone? And I don't mean Steve. I don't mean Longero. I don't mean Bastinza because I don't have to wonder with those guys because I, I knew them. I knew what was where we were and little parts. I know with Steve, 100%, you know? Um, so it's very frustrating. Well, it's not frustrating. But, you know, I'm 62 this summer. And you know, we're all over, we're the kids involved and we're all in our 60s now. So we're all going to start, you know, doing that age dance. Uh, I want the film out. I've been saying this for, what, 30 years now? <laughs> Allegedly, I don't know. I'm, I'm, because, and if it's done well, that's going to move it forward. Steve's in it. Mm. You know, Steve is in it. And uh, I guess as long as we look good in it. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it. yeah sh show the experience in as much as we know of its totality uh, and show the landing, show the uh, the occupants alighting from the craft, show the meeting, show the aftermath. Because to me, the aftermath was as important as, as the encounter itself, uh, the, the human cost uh, of all this. And uh, just a quick point about the, the screen, okay? Uh, I know from, and I'm not saying that this was the case that you and the others had experienced with the, the big screen thing, but I know from a, a mind control perspective, it's happened to me, they'll either take us singly or individually, uh, rather singly or in groups, into what seems to be a darkened theater, a proper darkened theater and with a big theater screen. And then they just run through in lightning sequence, uh, car chase scenes, war scenes, uh, this, that, and the other. And I, I think the intention is to scramble one's mind and memories before sending them back to bed or setting them back home or whatever. Because there was clearly sometimes I recall when I was in a, a semi-populated theater setting, watching something on, on a theater screen. And other times I would be uh, sitting there by myself, but like a couple of rows back and a couple of over uh, would be sitting, someone sitting there watching me as I'm being presented with this spectacle of car chases and war scenes and what have you. So my tentative intuitive guess is it's something just to scramble our memories before sending us back. So it wouldn't surprise me that that, technique i'm not saying again it's the case would happen with you guys but it wouldn't surprise me if something like that had been done and it was humans behind it not so much ets on the other hand and just to play devil's advocate there have been instances in in some underground bases where people reported seeing behind a screen or beside behind some partition sensing intuiting and lack of a better term, alien presence. So, you know, it, it goes both ways. And, uh, you know, getting back to, the, you know, the, the nature of the experience too is <clears throat> Roswell was a great case. It was a case that made the case, but like the researchers were saying 20, 30 years ago, we're in a race with the undertakers because our witnesses are starting to die out now. And, uh, you know, there's only a handful of them left. Similar, I'm not saying you guys have got a lot of <laughs> wake ups yet to go, but I'm, I'm saying that, you know, you know, I'm in my late 50s, you guys in your, your early mid 60s, you know, time marches on. So I would like to see more witnesses come forward because now, and l let's see if uh, all this talk about disclosure and UAPs and all that is just fluff and blarney. And let's see what happens when real players from Reynolds from Forest start to come back, start to emerge. And I hope Capel Green has something to do with that. I hope this discussion we're having has something to do with that. 
You have a safe place to come and talk about this on the Cosmic Switchboard Show, and you will be immediately, uh, you know, plugged into two real players such as yourself. A quick comment, then I'd like to bounce it back to you guys. I got to know John Vasquez very well, a good friend of mine. He was involved in the Fort Benning, Georgia, September 1977 mass alien abduction incident involving a whole infantry battalion out on a nighttime parade formation. Anyway, and all the mind control and skullduggery that uh, he endured, he was essentially assigned a, an, a co-author, get this, and you probably heard me tell the story before, but this co-author of his uh, did everything possible to isolate him from other witnesses coming forward. And I said to uh, John, I go, that doesn't make sense. He should be connecting you with people, uh, you know, individually debriefing you and then comparing your stories and letting you talk and see, uh, you know, what kind of correlations you can come up with, right? But this guy systematically kept John isolated. And I, I told John, this guy is not your friend. So the, the point being is it's yet another example of the – the efforts to keep this at an arm's length UAP tic-tac level, right? Instead of the sink your teeth where, where the, uh, you know, pedal meets the metal kind of thing that we're talking about here. And, uh, you know, Steve, I'd like your comments about that or anything else. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I wanted to bring up something that Larry had talked about. Um, when, when I wrote my book, like I said, I, I dedicated it to chapters to him. And I, I didn't go into like heavy, heavy, heavy detail about um, everything he talked to me about because it was, I don't know, you only got so much pages you got to fill, right? <laughs> but uh, but I, I do remember Larry specifically saying that there was some alien-looking being behind a screen. And I, I can confirm absolutely that he said that that day that he walked into my, to my dorm room. And, you know, it was weird because here I am just sitting there chilling out and he comes in closes the door, locks it. Hey, uh, can I talk to you? I heard you saw something the other day. And I was just like, oh, God, here we go. You know, and I was thinking, great, I'm just going to get my balls busted. <laughs> you know, But then he started telling me about his story. And I was just like, oh, OK. And at that point, um, I started, you know, just kind of looking around, perking up a little bit, maybe a little more situational awareness, you know. And uh, I did notice that there was this one female, and maybe Larry can confirm this with me, she got to the base maybe uh, i don't know maybe a month or so after larry's incident and she was a short cute little girl uh, might want to call her a honey bot a honey badger or a honey pot anyway she, she was hanging around all the security guys and she finally hooked up with one of them and uh she had something to do with the um uh, she was a photographer so she had something to do with that photo lab that larry came out of from the underground base and I know that the one guy that she ended up dating, he it was weird. We had such weird schedules. I don't want to say he was missing, but I didn't see him for, for a time. And it might have been he was on a different schedule than I was. But when I saw him again, he wasn't the same character. He, he had shaved his head. He broke up with this girl. And I said, hey, man, what's up, man? You seem well, you know, a little reserved because he was always kind of a, you know, outgoing person. Oh, this girl, she kind of screwed my head over, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. But whatever she did to him, he she definitely <laughs> messed with his head. And it might have just been a, a lover thing, but that girl always, always, always stuck in my mind as she was there either trolling or there as a disruptor or she was there to gather info or something. But she wasn't there for no reason. I guarantee you that. I, I, like I said, I can't go into a whole lot of detail, some of the stuff I did, but I used to profile people and... I can tell you, she was, she was somebody. She wasn't just some schmuck photographer. It wouldn't be the first time. Uh, the old KGB, GRU call them swallows, right? Uh, yeah. And then Americans, yeah. you know, call them honeypots. So um, yeah. East Germans, you know, send in the Romeo agents to engage in relationships with, uh, you know, spinster <laughs> type, mm -hmm. type as clerk at the parliament, right, in West Germany. Yeah. So those things yeah. do happen. And uh, yeah. thank you for sharing the bit about the uh, the alien behind the screen because and, and there's there's no guarantee that that's what what it is. Again, we're all speculating here, but but but, I, but from Lenny's point of view at that time, yes, that's where his mindset was was there was an alien behind the screen communicating yeah. with him. And yeah, he told me that. Yeah, yeah. and, and, mean, and, and all, everything that Larry said about that underground base, I can confirm that's exactly what he told me that day. Yeah. 
And, and the key takeaway that I got from it is similar things have been reported by alien abductees before. So I'm looking at this also not just from an investigating, a field, field investigator perspective, but someone who's had experiences and network with others who've had experiences. Because this Reynolds from Forest series of incidents encompasses the whole wide spectrum of the alien phenomena in a nutshell. Alien abductions, mm -hmm. missing time, deep black military skullduggery. So th that's mm -hmm. another thing that sets this apart. And the the efforts of the futile efforts of some of these researchers who delve, who stick a toe into to Rendlesham, and they only want to go so far. Uh, you know, just take it up to the point of uh, service people chasing lights through the forest and kind of leave it hanging there when so much had gone on, right? The, the whole deep black thing. And, and what, what Larry and you just talked about, the the alien bit behind the screen, to me, that, that's a key takeaway, no matter what we can ultimately make out of it, right? Uh, I only bring it up because it jibes with other testimony and other, other underground bases and other uh, abductee accounts. And uh, then we talk about the very real uh, physical after effects. And, and Larry has been very outspoken about this. Do, do you want to give uh, the, the viewers and listeners, Larry, just the rundown of some of the uh, maladies and illnesses you came down with as a result of this encounter you were supposedly never at okay wasn't in the air force some say uh, if you hear me on on the street guys sorry uh, and it gets worse it's worse now but it, the um flash burns to the eyes retinal damage not just me Others, others, not just John Burroughs. I was the first on record with all this. Exposure to a non-shielded nuclear device, medically documented. New Britain General Hospital in Connecticut when I was hemorrhaging five years after. Um, those are the most notable documented. The flash burns were like I looked at an arc welder's torch without the glasses for however brief and I think that's when that light went so yeah you know you don't make that up and the radiac thing when they came back in New Britain my ex my first wife who Steve met he was at my wedding uh, you know in 1985 by the way uh, that doctor came in a couple of them and asked me if I had ever been in the military. And I said, yeah. And they said, were you ever around? I remember a non-shielded nuclear device. And I said, not that I know of. And we did have nuke tacks on the base, but, you know, I didn't go near them or anything. But unshielded. And they said, were well, you showing signs of exposure to a non-shielded radioactive or nuclear device. And they almost did, didn't want nothing to do with it. They took blood tests, all this. Did I have trouble again uh, with it? It seemed to even out. Or I just drank a lot from that point on and never noticed, I don't know. But yeah, you know, real stuff. Way before John Burroughs and this payout and all that. I don't buy any of that. I don't buy it. There's no proof of it. He had health issues because big guy in the heart. And I have no doubt he went through his experience, of course. But all this, it's tic-tac now. UAP with the emphasis on P. Virtue signaling by God, half of them weren't even born. When Steve and I did that talk in Massachusetts, and he may not remember, this is how long we've been around. J. Allen Hynek was one of the speakers that day. You know, from close, I almost said from Star Wars, <laughs> from close encounters. You know, the guy with the big guys, didn't he? So that's how long Stan Freeman, these were all there's some are very nice people. 
I, I knew Alan. He was supportive of Rendlesham. But nowadays, the virtue signalers, the internet jockeys, all the specialists, if they don't want anything before history is they're trying to erase it. It's nothing new, is it, with history? Well, I'll be damned if they're going to do it with this. You know, I mean, I, you know, whatever I got left in me. I will say that movie that hopefully about this movie when it comes out, because I won't allow that no more. I'm way six years in. Come on now. But, uh, sorry, I don't mind saying it. You know, it's frustrating. But some of the people in it think it is a run-of-the-mill Rendlesham thing. We've all seen. I've been in many of them. You can't control it. This is not. This involves family. It involves friends. Real life that I've known from 50 years. Um, my best friend. Steve's in it. My dead parents are in it who were alive when the movie began. Uh, so, you know, these that that is the first thing where it's a human thing for once. Uh, the UFO types don't like the human part uh, of the subject. They forget it's really a human issue, isn't it? In the end. They're not interested in that. Interested in... You know, here's my next gig, you know, and I could go into all that bunch. They're all the same. And they do financially very well off the backs of people like Steve and myself. Mm -hmm. And Jim, all, you know, all of them, even Holt, he don't even, he does and doesn't care. And I hope this has been clear, but it's, uh, you know, you won't see MUFON booking me. I don't do the public UFO crap anymore. I, whether they want me to or not, believe it or not, I probably don't like them either. So they don't have to worry about what they think of me uh, at all. It, it, it's the probably mutual and too outspoken, man. And I always was. MUFON, just for an example, lets my co-author put a bio in the Denver MUFON symposium proceedings that was absolutely false, saying my book was stopped because I, I was a liar. And we contacted MUFON and said, that is a lie. Take that out. I stopped the book. I had to because of him. And they did nothing about it. But I've had run-ins with that gang for years. They're the ones that tried to stop me. This is where Gary Hazeltine got it wrong in his book, saying people made me change. No one made me do anything. They tried to stop me at the Washington, at the uh, American University. I was doing a talk, and they tried to stop me when I got to the meet of the third night. And I said, well, I ain't playing that. And I took 800 people out in the lawn and finished what I was supposed to be doing. So you'll never see me on their Christmas. There's been questions about uh, MUFON for so long and the, uh, the sometimes curious behavior of Walt Andrus. You guys remember him, the, the old long-term uh, MUFON. He was the guy that came on stage trying to stop me in D.C. and Walt, yep. That's all, yep. Yeah, and what they're doing also is uh, it's an effort in memory holding. We're seeing this in the, the culture wars now, the, the woke culture wars, the uh, <clears throat> memory holding of, of all that had gone on in the past, civilization, basically. It's all going down the tubes now for the new uh, whack job normal. And, of course, the UFO field would be uh, the, the prime target of all that. And hence, these never-ending efforts of, of minimizing the uh, significance uh, of, of Rendlesham. But all these weird bit players... Uh, it's of all the cases out there in in our field, nothing quite 
matches the, the rogues gallery of all these clowns and whack jobs that have attached themselves to Rendlesham. And that's deliberate. It's in order to increase the, the, the noise to signal ratio. And it's yet another reason why a lot of these newbies in our field uh, refuse to do more than just stick a toe in, into Rendlesham because you know, there, it comes with too much baggage. It's too overwhelming. There's too much information, really, for them to, to bother with. It's not some little five-minute video they can click on, right? So, you know, we're doing our part to bring Rendlesham back front and center where it belongs. And I always look at things from a historical perspective because that's what I'm into is, is real history. And the... All the aspects, again, that I said earlier of, of the, the human aspect to it, the alien abductions, the missing time, the, the skullduggery afterwards, if, if taken on, on a case-by-case -case basis and, and, and put together, we still have arguably the most important case of all time. And, you know, in, in the time we got left, Steve, I, I, I'd like your thoughts on uh, where we can possibly push Rendlesham further out, if that's possible, what we can do to, you know, maybe you can uh, say a word to any potential people who want to come forward. Uh, and, and uh, you know, even before Capital Green, the documentary comes out, you know, what they can do to, to make their voices heard in all this. And then your thoughts on that, Larry. Well, I think, I think it'd be nice if more people came forward. Um, as far as my night, it was only me and Palmer, so there's nobody else to come forward. And you know, they, one of the only reasons I even injected myself in this whole thing was people were saying, oh, well, the officers must have known, you know, that they must have already been participants in this. And that's why I, I detailed the night I had my incident. They seemed absolutely as clueless as I was about what was going on, at least at that point. I don't think they'd been right into anything. After that, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that night they were as wide-eyed and bushy-tailed as the rest of us trying to figure out what was going on, you know. Um, but as far as new people coming in and stuff, you know, it just seems everybody is lazy. You know, I wrote a book. I, I could tell you probably on 10 fingers and 10 toes how many copies I sold. <laughs> Nobody wants to read it. Everybody just wants to go to a podcast, listen for 20, 30 minutes, and get on with their life. And I mean, this case is so much bigger than that. If somebody wants to get into it, they need to get into it, like both feet, head to toe, and do their own research. But nobody's going to do that. Everybody's lazy these days. You know, I mean, that's why I said I, I've got a real problem with investigators versus what I call parasites. Just like Larry said, they just attach to you. They suck you dry. They move on to the next case, write another book, do whatever to advance their agendas or what I call a quasi-religion. You know, I mean, when you start messing with people's religion and saying yeah i really don't think you're a uh, orc from zork and you're not a palladian then people start getting upset you know? <laughs> so you know when, when you can remove the uh the tinfoil hats from the from the whole subject and actually get people in there that are scientists researchers and something like that great but i think the government's probably going to keep it the way it is and keep it all messed up and convoluted because nobody wants to know what the truth is or they don't want everybody to know what the truth is whatever that truth may be yeah i don't think we'll ever find out unless they generally want us to find out or if something happens and some alien lands on the lawn of the white house then maybe something will happen there, there is some damage control at work because they're definitely trying to change the narrative. Uh, Larry, your thoughts on all this and about the possibility and hopefully more witnesses coming forward, especially after Cable Green comes out, if it does. Well, it better. Because uh, really, how many six years can, do you have? I, I, I agree with all, all Stephen said and, and yourself. I have spoken to some people quiet, privately, for real, that have said to me, with what they've put you through, obviously you got around the UFO types, because I'm not talking about a person like yourself, James. There's a lot of good people I've met over the years. And then, then there's the nefarious. And uh, 
or just the plain ignorant or fame hookers or whatever you want. There's no fame you want, folks. And uh, But my view is that, and I saw Gary in his book, Oh, Come Forward. Well, that's very easy to say. Out in outside, from inside, like Steve and I can, and there's no offense to you, I wouldn't wish it. And they've seen what, say, for me, for example, the attacks, the this, and then you know, lies. So you want bad things about me? Ask Steve about Rhode Island. Anyway, you uh, <laughs> wish. There's a few people I'd wish it on. They could to this day. So I'm not an advocate for people now coming forward. I think April Green more is going to surprise some people that it is how uh, being, I am the whistleblower of Rendlesham. No matter what, people don't like that, but that's the facts. <laughs> and uh, the, the matter uh, lies that uh, there's some people that have said, I wouldn't go near this thing now. I've seen what they've done to you. I've seen what they've done to even, you know, the, some of the darlings. You know, Jim has his attackers. John has his. I'm sure Adrian can find a that aren't, you know, all oh, Adrian, you know. And he's a lovely guy. I'm not knocking it, but... Uh, and then you have to look at how the general public still view this. I live in, you know, Liverpool. I think it's a progressive, you know, the Beatles and all that come from, Ringo comes from down the road here, you know. But I can tell he hasn't been singing tonight because this is horrific tonight here, the singing. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, it's horrible. Must be, must be me over there singing. <laughs> you have the average person you know, they just think, you know, if they know me in general, just, oh, you know, the UFO thing. The people have not evolved. They don't even report about this ATIP stuff here in England or that Congress have had sit-downs about this recently. It's not reported here. The newspaper headlines and the still were flying saucer spotters where... Uh, it's just the same headlines they had in 1983. Uh, Bug-eyed aliens, all that kind of thing. And it's just a, a, a laugh to sell newspapers. And it has not changed. And you got the people behind you. I know even here, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. You know, always oh, a bit that crazy yank. But you'll find the same mentality home in the States. Sometimes they're in your family. Sometimes. Until years go by and they go, holy crap, I had no idea. And you, you're my brother Scott, right? I had no gut. He said, Larry, I had, I'm sorry, I had no idea. He said, I thought you were having a laugh on the family. And he goes, I didn't know. But uh, I think the general public are ignorant and willfully ignorant and intentionally made to be ignorant. And then there's just plain ignorant people running around. But... Uh, yeah, I don't know what the yeah to give a voice to sound like Steve in this film. If I never do another thing, that's fine. I'll always come on your show, James, with Steve, and uh, and Steve, uh, tell the folks uh, about your book. You've I've been pushing. I try, and it's a great book. But what's the title? You must promote, promote, promote. <laughs> yeah, Which well, actually, so my so my book is called Rendlesham to Redemption. The story of transformation. And, you know, that's one thing is everybody signs me up for these podcasts and they just sit down and go, okay, what'd you see? And it's like, well, my book's got a couple chapters about Rendlesham. It's got a chapter about Larry. It's got a chapter about a little bit of the aftermath. But then the other half of the book is about my life afterwards. It's, it's about me falling on my face a hundred times and picking myself back up. It's got nothing to do with the UFO situation. That was just the catalyst to my downfall. You know, so, I mean, it's an interesting read about, you know, you know, hope, you know, don't give up hope. Just keep trying to stick your nose to the grindstone and, you know, sooner or later you'll make it. You know, I, I, you know, that's one thing I always had an issue with, Larry, was everybody craps on you about, oh, you, you did this, you did that, all these accusations. 
And they look at me and they go, oh, Steve's in a nice, a decent upright. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I told them the truth about half the, I couldn't write half the stuff on the book I wrote. I'd, I'd be in an international court. <laughs> you know? I mean, seriously. You know, I, and I'm the darling child. What are you, crazy? <laughs> Way more evil stuff than you've ever done. I, I, I've only been half evil, but I have read, I have done everything short of shoot Kennedy, even though I was only two and a half. <laughs> short of that, time traveled back, but I have read things. I'm like, my God, I'd be in prison for life. You know, all this kind of thing. I held yeah. licensed industry here and government approved, you know, license and all, you, you know, criminal record back with, but I've read it all, but that was particularly a very famous troll and supporter of and friends with the seven seven bombers of all things. And yet she got a lot of traction, you know, we know who she is. And mm -hmm. there was this bunch up and you know, I was very stupid to get around people, you know. I wrote a book with one like that. You know, I don't hate Peter, but uh you know, I, I looked at him kind of like a big brother in some ways. And I, yeah, I could be, like my ex said to me, she goes, well, you know, when you were drinking, which I used to, you know, heavy, you know, you could be kind of nasty and all. So you can, and I said, well, yeah, I'll hands up to that and certain things. I'm no saint, but man, some of the things, uh, my son read all that stuff on the internet. And they wouldn't want to meet him in an alley, but they, uh, it's not nice when your kids read this stuff and it, they know otherwise. Mm -hmm. Family know. Uh, I yeah. just want out. I want the best for you and that roundhouse build you're doing. In the media, you know, for 40, 41 years, something. Related to Rendlesham. I have to say, you're, and you talk about the Art Bells, I used to fall asleep on his show. He had the commercials, and uh, and I'm not knocking him. And so many people, but you're the, you're the most engaging, even though I know you like you, uh, one of the most engaging broadcasters because you have knowledge way beyond uh, the, just the flying saucer talks. And like Steve was telling about his book, it is a human story again. So it's not a flying saucer book. I used to think my Left at East Gate book wasn't a UFO book, really. It's kind of a real schizophrenic kind of book, but it's all true. And uh, But it's not. And, and that's all right. It, it had its run. And uh, I may do it again. I may not. Who knows? I'm lazy. But I just want the film, Capel Green, to be out this year, as I'm promised it will. I need to see it. And I hope it brings very good closure uh, to it, uh, to uh, folks like Steve and myself. It will bring back those days. I have seen some things of it. And, uh, of course, you get a free uh, Blu-ray or whatever the heck these things are. But it will be out this year. If uh, and I guarantee it will be out this year. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's going to be epic when it does come out. And uh, th thank you for saying that. Uh, by the way, uh, my feeling has always been that the truth is what's important. And the uh, you know the, the the point about the misrepresentations and, and what have you. Uh, I mean. I, I don't know Larry Fawcett. I never knew him, but I, I would go back from the outside looking in and say, I think if, if I didn't know any better, Fawcett botched this first debriefing of you. I mean, he could have gotten so much more out of you. He, she didn't have to have that skeptical attitude about the aliens. Uh, I, so for, at the outset, uh, there was, there was some, you know, hindrances, you know, at work. So, but, you know, this is a process of, of rectifying all this and, uh, that that's what my role is. And and one quick point before I forget, I'm of the old Leonard Stringfield type. <laughs> so when, when witnesses, especially ex-military types, come to me, I'm absolutely fine if they want it to be anonymous because I have no problems with people screaming 
uh, oh, you won't tell us their identities. Well, I'm not supposed to tell you their identities. That was the condition of coming forward and sharing information. So I'm definitely open to any information shared anonymously that if we're given per permission, and it doesn't have to be permission to share all of the uh, given information, just however much the source is willing to allow us to, to release. And I'd be happy just to do that because I'm just looking for more pattern data correlations that will, uh, you know, fill in the blanks of, uh, of Rendlesham. So, uh, you know, just want to put it out there. I know it's a minefield. I'm not asking all these witnesses to step forward <laughs> and walk into a minefield. I, I'm asking if they feel so inclined, come forth, share whatever they're comfortable sharing, and we'll do it completely anonymously and, uh, you know, to safeguard their, their security. I walked in a minefield once. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fellas, uh, this has been a blast. Let's let's do it again. And uh, thank you for battling through the the combo issues, Larry. Uh, true trooper once again. Thank you, Steve. And you know, Mia yeah. culpa. I, I I botched the time zone difference because I'm working with two different cats. One in the continental U.S., the other in the U.K., and me down under. And I I botched the time zone difference. So. So Steve came on earlier uh, than he needed to, but at least we had a good chat, uh, you know, prior yeah, to, right. to Larry coming on. So, so once again, Steve, once again, Larry, thank you for your service uh, to the country. Thank you for everything you've done over the years of bringing this information out. Oh, you're welcome. You very for having me on. And uh, to our dear listeners out there, wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, have a very pleasant time. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.